Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to give it a few more minutes to make sure everybody that has a chance is on, and then we will start. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our bite sized lecture today. My name is Rita Gayud, and I'm serving as the um, Southeast chapter president. Um, I am uh, pleased to welcome you to our uh, bite sized lecture that will focus on the use of medical Twitter. Um, we have uh, different speakers that will give us different views on how to best optimize the use of medical Twitter. Our speakers include Roberta um, Talarico, Sean Barnes, um, and Marie Brown, Diane McLaughlin, and Ashley DePriest. We thank them for taking the time to put this together for us. Uh, for some of us who struggle navigating Twitter and keeping up with all the updates, this should be a really, really great interactive um, talk um, with different tips and tricks for the trade. In addition, we'd also like to remind everyone that we have our quarterly educational meeting uh, at the end of the month on August 30th. Um, it will uh, be hosted by the president of SCCM, Dr. Sandy Kangil, and it will focus on patient and medication safety in the ICU. And with that, I would love to hand over to our first speaker, um, Ashley DePriest. Thank you, Rita, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I guess actually good afternoon, maybe good morning to some. Um, my name is Ashley DePriest. I am a registered dietitian and clinical nutrition manager at Wellstar Kennestone in Marietta, Georgia. Um, and I have been on Twitter since about 2009. Um, my fun Twitter story that I always think about, the first thing I think about with Twitter is that I actually learned um, about Michael Jackson's death through Twitter. Um, so that was a while ago and it was just a different change. Um, and, and since then, we've really evolved in how we've used Twitter. Um, you know, it used to be a very social um, news kind of source. Um, and now we are really using it for um, what you'll learn today, a lot of different, very, very valuable um, things. And so um, what I'm gonna do is, this is very, very, um, raw, I guess, so to speak, but I'm going to walk everyone through how to create a Twitter account. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of Twitter. So um, for those of you who either don't have an account or maybe you've created an account and are just sort of hanging out on the app and don't really know what to do first, um, that's where I will go, um, go through. And then we have some other speakers today that are going to go through some higher level uses of Twitter, which I'm really excited to hear about. So um, with that being said, I hope everyone has a little bit of patience with me because we are starting from the beginning. Um, we weren't really able to practice this because if you practice it, you create the account. So we wanted to do this completely fresh. Um, so as you can see, the way you would start is through twitter.com and you would click on your create an account. And we are going to create a new account today called Bite Size Med Education, Bite Size Med Ed. Uh, and we're going to use an email. And for now, I'm going to use my uh, my Gmail um, because our um, SCCM account is already attached to an email. And I'm just going to pick a date because this isn't an individual, um, but we want to make sure that this person is old enough to use Twitter. So let's go back to 1980. 
Um, of course, if you're doing this for yourself, you would put your own information in. Okay, and we can customize our experience. Um, we'll go ahead and hit next here and sign up and create the account. So now I've got to go into my email and check for my verification code. Give me just a minute. Okay, 2107-21. And then everyone's going to see my phone number. I'll do this one really quick. <laughs> and they will send you a text. This one might take a few seconds. Hmm. Let's try resending. Go back and make sure I put that in. Yep. So this is live television, folks. We're gonna have a lot of delays. We may have some unexpected uh, things occur here. So, oh, it's a phone call instead of a text. So that's interesting. 793-485. Hmm. We're going to have to listen. There we go. Okay, and we're going to make up a password. And we're in. So the first thing you want to do when you create a profile is to add a photo. We're going to, um, well, let's skip that one for now because I don't have anything saved. But of course, you would want to add a photo that helps attract people to your to your page. Um, Twitter profiles without photos, even if it's not necessarily your face, but um, Twitter profiles without photos typically um, aren't as considered as friendly. Um, they may, may be an indication of a bot, for example. So always make sure you add a photo, even if it's not of yourself. Um, in our bio, we are, again, the bite-sized medical education. So I'm going to say providing easily digestible medical education. And that can always be updated and edit, edited later. Ed. So this is where you are um, also updating your Twitter, what's called a Twitter handle. And this is how people recognize you um, and find you. This is your username, so to speak. Um, and that can also be updated and changed later as well. So the first thing it's gonna do is to ask you to follow some accounts. We're gonna do something a little bit different um, and won't follow anything yet if it will let me. Looks like it's going to ask me to follow something. So let's follow world news for now. And here we are. This is your opening page um, for your Twitter profile. So at the top, you have a, um, a box where you can actually create your tweet. You have your home page. You have a hashtag search where you can explore. You have your direct messages, et cetera, et cetera. So um, let's go through creating a tweet really quick. Um, it's pretty simple. You just type whatever you want. Um, we will be sharing bite-sized medical education 
brought to you by SECMSE. So um, here what I'm doing is tagging another account. So if you want to uh, notify someone or tag them in a tweet, you hit the at symbol and type their username or their hand, what we call their handle. Um, and so we've tagged our Southeast chapter region here. The other thing that you can add to tweets that you've probably heard of are hashtags. Um, and hashtags allow us to, to sort of quantify and, um, and create um, searchable tags onto pieces of information. So the tag I'm gonna use here is a pretty common one used on Twitter, F-O-A-N-E-D, and that stands for Free Open Access Medical Education. Um, capitals and lower cases don't matter, but they do look better when you're able to, you know, make them the correct uh, capitalization and whatnot. Um, some options with tweeting, you can always add a picture, add a GIF, you can create a poll. These are always interesting, lots of different poll options. Um, you can, of course, use emojis, and you can also schedule tweets for the future. Um, that's a feature that we use a lot with our Southeast Chapter account. So then next, we're going to just hit tweet. And there we go. There's our first um, tweet, as you can see. Now, going back to the hashtags, the way that you um, can use a hashtag, here's a great way to do it, is if you see one that's interesting to you, you would click that hashtag. And that brings up every single tweet um, that has that tag on it. So here you see um, a tweet from innovation, the innovation medicine. You see some physicians. These, um, these are gonna be your top tweets based on interactions. You can also search them by the latest. So the most recent tweets. Um, again, here's ours at the very top of the page 36 seconds ago. Um, Nephrology Journal Club, we've got a few other um, tweets here with that tag on it. So that's a really great way to use, um, to use hashtags is to really search for that information. Um, you can also search hashtags over here on the side. Um, I'm going to go find myself and show you guys one other feature um, is that's really helpful for those of you who may be joining for the first time. Um, and that is a list. So I'm going to go to my own personal profile because I do have um, lists that I share. Um, this one is an ICU nutrition tweeting list. And so what a list does is allow you to combine um, profiles of people that share a common interest or are tweeting about similar things. So I've created this list currently has 33 folks on it. Um, that has all the people that are tweeting about ICU nutrition. You see Anne Marie is on here, uh, myself, we have a couple of RDs um, and other physicians, different organizations like Aspen. Um, and so this is a really great place to start your Twitter journey um, is to go in and follow this list or follow a list. And so you can find various ones. Another really popular list, and um, I'll show you another feature here, you can search at the top right hand corner. Um, one, of, one of our social media friends. Oops, here we go. Sapna has a really, really, really great PEDS ICU um, list that has a lot, a lot of folks on it. Um, and so she is um, really a big uh, advocate for this PEDS ICU hashtag as well. So for our PEDS folks, that's um, a really, really great hashtag to use and to search. So I'm gonna go in and view her lists. She has quite a few critical care experts. Um, pediatric critical care is a really big one. Women in critical care, for example. So we can go into pediatric critical care here she has um, 1.3 thousand followers, uh, 960 followers and members, several members. So again, a really, really good way to just start your journey um, with, um, with Twitter to find folks to follow. Um, and so that would be my first recommendation if you are new to Twitter is to just get on, find some lists, find some folks to follow and just start um, what we call lurking. Um, just, just learning and looking around um, at, at, the, at the space and seeing what you can find and learn. Uh, but certainly don't be afraid to tweet. Tweet whatever you're thinking, tweet helpful information. Um, even if you feel like it's something everyone knows, some of, some of my most um, frequently interacted with tweets 
um, are usually things that I think are pretty common knowledge, uh, but they get shared and interacted with so much more than you would think. So um, I think that's really a lesson with Twitter is you just never know what is going to be popular, what's going to help other people. And that really is the um, you know main point of sharing Twitter and social media with for medical use is to share and disseminate information. Um, so with that being said, I want to see if my other co-presenters had anything else that maybe I should show really quickly before um, we, we move on to the next presenter. Will you click back on the home page so that you can see notifications? Yes, great. Thank you. So notifications would be right here. So if someone were to um, either follow you or see Diane liked our tweet, so that shows up here. She also followed us back. So that's where that would show up there. Also, if anyone tags you in a tweet, it would show up here in the mentions. Awesome. And actually, just a, minute, a remind uh, that uh, SCM has uh, the top influencers that you can follow, the social media uh, committee. So I, I can send it to you if you don't find it. Yeah. They, but they, but we have this option to to follow people directly from SCM. Yeah, and that's that. They do have that list. Thank you. Really good. Um, really good list to start to follow as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do it right now. Yeah, this list is a bunch of folks, a lot of folks that um, really have a lot of experience with Twitter. I think um, all, several of us on this panel are on this list um, that have just been, again, using it for years and, and really um, they have good ideas with, you know, how to tweet, how to structure your tweets and um, what to include, different hashtags, that sort of thing. So a um, really good list to start. Thank you. Awesome. Well, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email, however you prefer. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to move on to um, our next speaker. Thank you. All right, guys, so this is actually um, kind of a good segue and we'll build on what Ashley has done and how you go from having an account to building your network. So my disclosures, I am one of the uh, volunteers for the social media committee for SCCM and then I have an appointment with the Neurocritical Care Journal as a social media ambassador. So first is to kind of differentiate between what social media is versus what social networking is. And as you can see, the range of social media is quite vast. Um, and so there has to be a lot of intent in what you're doing when you start a Twitter account. Social media really is just short for social medium, and it's just the setting that you're doing networking in. So if you're using this platform as a professional networking, then it's going to be a lot different than what you might be doing on TikTok or Snapchat. Which brings us to your profile. So I don't know if you guys remember when all of these came out, um, that how you represent yourself is very different dependent upon the setting. And so if you're using this for med Twitter or neuro Twitter, or however you might wanna use it, you want your profile to represent yourself like that. Uh, and Included in that is your bio, which Ashley started to show you. And one of the things to consider when you're putting your affiliations in, a lot of organizations have very clear social media policies that ask you to put uh, a disclaimer that your views don't necessarily represent the, the views of the organization. So check your policy. But it's a good thing to put what your affiliations are because it might help people find you. So, um, if you're active in SCCM and you put that into your bio, then somebody searching at SCCM might say, oh, okay, this person's active there and this is somebody that I want to see. So back in the old days when social media was first starting and I don't, the first site that I was on was, was MySpace and everybody 
automatically was friends with Tom. Well, that's not the case. As you saw when Ashley was building that site, um, you start with zero followers following nobody. So how do you find people to follow? Well, we started going into this. Some of it's looking at affiliations, some of it's finding friends, um, but add people freely that you wanna interact with. The recommendations that they're initially gonna give you when you sign up are gonna be very generic. So unless everybody wants to follow rap and world news, which is very, very possible, uh, you again wanna do this with intent. So if the purpose is professional networking, then you're gonna look at organizations like SCCM, AACN, Aspen, and you can kind of see some of the organizations that I interact with, and it's, it's all very connected. Um, and we mentioned lurking, but after lurking comes interacting, uh, and some of that is going to be as easy as retweeting things that you find relevant and starting to use hashtags and then tagging other people. And the reason that this is important is this will help you build followers. So when you tag somebody else, then it's going to show up on their timeline. So if you start tagging some of these top influencers, then it's gonna bring people to your bio and your profile. And then SCCM has been very helpful in showing uh, different hashtags that are associated with SCCM. So this is a good place to start. And you're gonna see SCCM So Me, which is short for social media, uh, is tagged a lot. And so this is one of those tags you might wanna follow and start using consistently when you're putting forward critical care knowledge. We already touched upon lists, but this really is a great way to build your network. You see that by following that SCCM top influencers, you're immediately following 47 people that are posting consistently and relevant high quality information. So this is a little bit different than the kind of posts that you're posting on, on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, a lot of times these are uh, peer reviewed journal articles or uh, information such as when SCCM went from New Orleans to San Francisco for next year's Congress. Um, so high yield information. And you can also build your own list when you start to put together people that all fit a certain category. There are roughly 330 million Twitter users. And so the more that you follow, the more you need to start organizing. And again, it's kind of a way that if you wanna build your network by putting somebody in your list, it's gonna notify them and they may follow you back. Um, and following is not friending. It's, I think you have interesting information or I want you to see the information that I'm gonna be posting. So we're all a little bit scientific here, I would say. and. One of the other ways as you're getting along is to start to follow your analytics. So if you uh, go to analytics.twitter.com or if you're on the, the homepage and you go down to the three dots, you can find your analytics. And these are updated every month. And certain things you're gonna look for are impressions, which is how many times somebody uh, looks at whatever you've posted uh, when somebody mentions you, how many people clicked on that link. And then little tricks are the more media that you put in, the more likely people are to look at it. You can see how often somebody clicks on it and expands your image or clicks on your link to visit. Uh, so this is a good way to see what's connecting and what's not. And the more that you start to use this, you wanna continue to grow that network. And you can, and I've noticed when I'm just putting little blurbs of information, a lot of times they get missed. Once you start tagging people and adding the hashtags and adding media, this is how you're really going to grow your audience. And so I, I check it every month. So how do you know you're on the right track? Uh, retweets are a sign that 
whatever you posted is is hitting and it's considered valuable. So somebody saw what you posted and said, oh, this is important and relevant information, so I'm gonna share it as well. Likes is like, like a virtual high five. Um, when somebody is curious, they might expand detail. When they uh, find whatever you posted relevant, they'll click on the link and actually visit it. Whenever somebody's seeing these tweets, they might actually go to your profile and see what else you've posted, check out your bio, see who else you're following and who's following you. Uh, mentions, as I said, is a way that sometimes people are mentioning you because they might think that you find whatever they're posting interesting. Uh, they might want to tag you so that your followers can see whatever they're posting. So sometimes if, um, like we'll use uh, Wes Eli, if somebody's posting about delirium, obviously a lot of people follow him that are interested in this. So if they wanted to draw attention to anybody that might be interested in delirium, they might tag him, even though he doesn't actually have anything to do with that particular tweet uh, as a way to drive traffic. And then the more that you do this and the more that you post, the more followers you're going to get. So kind of to summarize the, the tips and tricks of it are you have to do it intentionally. So you're not going to post throwaway tweets. Uh, you want them to be somewhat thought out. Uh, follow people. It's not, like I said, it's not a like. It's not saying that you're friends. It's somebody that you're interested in hearing what they have to say or that you want to see what you have to say. Tag and hashtag every time you tweet uh, putting media or putting polls or putting anything other than words it's going to get more impressions more people noticing and after you go from lurking and you start with a, a tweet or two then start tweeting consistently if you really want to build your network and like Ashley said, I think everybody on this panel is uh, pretty active on Twitter. So feel free to, to tweet us and add us and we'll help you grow your profile as well. Does anybody have any questions out there? Or any of the other panelists wanna add? Diana, I think the one thing that is important to remember is that when you look at the analytics informations, we can have a lot of other information too. So you can look back for when you started from today to see what happened and you can try to improve your connections for sure but you can have data so in some point uh, some journals are doing that so this is an uh, important tool for us to understand what who we are reaching and how far the information is going. Yeah, the analytics are really cool, actually. And you can see, like, I just got back from a, like a couple of weeks vacation and you can see like my tweets dropped off and like my impressions dropped off. And you can correlate that with what's going on with life or what's going on in healthcare. Um, when COVID started and people started tweeting about that, a lot of, there were a lot more impressions and a lot more engagement all of a sudden. So it's definitely worth looking at and it can, be a tool to help build and then just something uh, for the nerd inside all of us. Yeah, and now the journals are using that as something that uh, is happening with the publications too. So you can access your publication and see how many people tweeted and retweeted your uh, publication in the Twitter. <laughs> but this is possible too. Yeah, and it's actually helping increase impact factors by driving traffic to read journal articles. All right, well, thanks, guys. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Marie Brown, and I'm an associate professor and director of the Acute Care Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, I'm also a PICU nurse practitioner. 
And I'm going to continue to build on what um, you've already heard by talking about a particular way that I have collaborated and used Twitter as a micro learning tool and a networking tool for my students. Um, I um, also, I didn't think to really put them out there, but it was probably a good idea that Diane did as disclosures. I am currently the vice chair for the social media committee for the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And I'm also the so, uh, a social media ambassador for the American Society of Parenteral Enteral Nutrition and the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive Care. So when I began a few years ago um, engaging my students um, in Twitter as um, an important networking tool. It was because I have found it as that for the reasons that you've already heard. And when I begin teaching them about it, we, in, we incorporate it over a period of three semesters. Um, we talk about the fact that you, there is a range of activity from observing, otherwise known as lurking, all the way up through active contributions of original material um, or tutorials and the like. And we talk about the fact that it actually makes a difference um, in your networking and how they can much more rapidly advance um, their path, their network, um, engagement with societies as well as individuals that can begin to accelerate um, and allow them to further explore their careers and their interests. And one of the things I use as an example here, um, reflecting on one of the comments that Diane made about the increase in traffic uh, at the launch of the pandemic, is many of you may have seen this article published by um, Sapna Kuchadkar and Chris Carroll um, fairly early into the pandemic, where they analyzed um, users tweeting both PEDS ICU, because this was a look at particularly within the PEDS community, as well as one of the COVID-19 related hashtags and how rapidly um, information was disseminated across Twitter via both, as you can see here, organizations as well as individuals across um, not only the globe, but a multitude of disciplines. And how that actually helped us rapidly facilitate information far faster than our conventional means of presentations or publications. In particular, it's um, at this point kind of, um, kind of, we think of it almost as funny little odd thing, but in fact, um, in the Western Hemisphere, we first found out about what we now know as MISC from tweeting from our colleagues in the UK who were the first to begin to identify this peculiar syndrome that seemed to affect some kids post a COVID infection. So Sean, you're gonna recognize this picture, but I have to laugh just to build off of many, what I have discovered is many of my students, even if they're active on social media, are not necessarily on Twitter. And so I walk them through um, from the beginning, um, as Ashley talked about how to um, actually launch an account. Um, and we also emphasize um, this idea of you need to declare your presence, however limited you might feel it is, from the point that you join to make you more attractive to others who may want to professionally network with you. Because I know that if someone uh, follows me and I can't tell who they are, they don't provide me any information about their professional affiliation, um, there's not a picture, I am definitely not following that person back. And so you can see here, this is one of my students from my first cohort a few years ago. When on the left, when she first started, she didn't have any bio and no picture. And how simple the transformation of adding her picture and just a few words of a bio made it clear she was out here in a professional manner. So, when we go through the different pieces of education, we go through pretty much everything you've kind of seen um, Ashley go through and some of Diane as well, but we specifically walk through all the functionality, including some other things like helping them know that each tweet has its own URL and you can copy that, how you can bookmark tweets that you wanna come back to. Maybe you wanna look up an article that you see um, linked in there. We make a big point of talking about um, adherence to HIPAA and privacy. If you're tweeting anything about a specific case, we talk about hashtags. Many people don't understand they're searchable. 
we talk about professional organizations, polls, how to actually create a Twitter thread. And I even provide some helpful hints such as keyboard shortcuts when you're on a device um, to make it much faster for you to um, post hashtags or other phrases that perhaps you use frequently. I provide some examples of professional societies and organizations that might be um, of interest to an acute care PMP student. And so I would encourage you to follow those that are of interest to you. They might be specialty specific organizations like nephrology. Um, I also encourage them to follow local government or municipality um, accounts that might provide them valuable interest about what's going on in public health or related topics in their area that will inform their network and inform their practice. I also share some potential pertinent hashtags and we talk about how they will see hashtags once they get out there and can begin using the same hashtags that are pertinent to their areas of interest. I also really emphasize that hashtags have to be followed exactly. As Ashley mentioned, you can get away with not necessarily capitalizing the same, but the rest of the hashtag has to be exactly the same or it's not searchable in that hashtag. One of the ways that I begin to um, incorporate it in our routine within our curriculum are things like um, creating a class specific hashtag. So each class has its own hashtag, Emory, AC, P, and P, and then the year they graduate. And my students graduate in December. So this year's it's Emory, AC, P, and P 2022. So now each cohort has its own unique searchable hashtag that they can use during and beyond their graduation. And, and some of the ways that I provide easy ways for them to practice and use it is when I find pertinent information out there, like this great tweet from Vanessa Lanziotti, who's a PICU intensivist in Brazil um, with some great um, current monkeypox information. As I retweet it and tag not only PEDS ICU, but also um, our class hashtag. And then I might ask them um, to search our hashtag and say, what, what did you learn about this week? We also have other assignments where they have to incorporate social media into another assignment. So for example, they have to give these 15 minute, I call them mini grand rounds presentation on a particular topic. And part of the assignment is they have to tweet out an article with one to two threaded tweets that go with it that, that demonstrate scholarly appraisal of that article. And we moved on to uh, this past year, really what, a, a micro learning event. Micro learning, if you're not familiar with it, is learning that is performed in short time bursts. It typically does not require a lot of effort from um, the individuals during that session and it's simple and or follows narrow topics. And so last fall, um, in collaboration with um, Dr. Sarah Talent and Dr. Ramey Heckel um, of Duke University Acute Care PMP um, program, we collaborated and started an ACPMP, Acute Care Pediatric MP Chat Twitter Journal Club. Our learning objectives you can see here was for the students to be able to critically analyze the data and evidence to advance practice, to be able to or disseminate um, their inquiry to diverse audiences using novel modalities, thus Twitter, and for them to be able to identify and connect with experts in pediatric acute care via social media. We um, piloted it this past fall and we will be expanding this fall now with um, a num and spring uh, with a number of other schools from across the country. What did we do exactly? So this is the flyer that we shared with um, program directors where we really outlined our process and what we provide as the leaders. Um, is that we provide pre-recorded sessions for their students and for the faculty because many of the faculty we've learned are not necessarily engaged in social media or Twitter. So they get some of the same um, education that we've talked about today. They get pre-recorded sessions and then we host um, a live session for the faculty so to make sure everybody's clear about the process. We also then host a live session for the group of students to make sure that we can do some live play on Twitter with them and get their questions answered. 
we encourage the faculty to do some of the informal incorporation of Twitter that I've outlined and um, that each faculty needs to create um, a school and class-based hashtag. Um, the um, journal clubs last for 48 hours and which seems long for a micro learning but the students are really only engaged and for that activity for a few minutes at a time in small bursts over that so it still meets the criterion for a micro learning activity um, a rubric is provided so that students are evaluated on this assignment consistently um, across the programs we um, registered the ACPMP chat hashtag with um, Simpler so that we could run some um, basic analytics um, when we were done. And the students are provided an article well ahead of time uh, on a particular topic. This fall, for example, it's on hepatorenal syndrome. And one of the faculty will post the article. The students then, within the first 24 hours, have to post a response that clearly demonstrates scholarly appraisal, critique, and questioning um, of the article. They also have to respond within the, the second 24 hours to at least one student from a different school, the idea, of course, to expand their networks. And they also have to post a link to a related article with um, a summary indicating they didn't just find an article and post it, but they've actually read it and they provide us an article appraisal or summary of that and how it contributes to the topic and the conversation. Each student needs to use the ACPMP chat and their school hashtag in each tweet so that we can search by school as well as search for the overall ACPMP chat um, threads. Um, one of the ways that we know that at least for some students, these actions culminating in the journal club have really made a difference was this tweet um, screenshot that you see on the left was one of the Duke students who after our Twitter journal club um, posted using their hashtags um, went during one of their on-campus events. We presented our pilot project at the World Congress of Pediatric Intensive Care um, this past summer and um, as you can see one of the things that we did was we asked the students to evaluate the assignment and they highly rated the assignment um, they found value in Twitter for their professional development um, they um, strongly agreed that this um, ACP and P chat journal club effectively increased their understanding of the topic so the content delivery was effective and they thought that 48 hour time frame because they could come and go intermittently was adequate. So this fall, like I said, we're going to be expanding to a number of schools and in the spring because it's probably a, a, a good assignment for students near the end of their curriculum and schools vary as to um, how and when uh, their programs are completed. But we continue to lead these and um, are hoping actually to publish this endeavor um, here in the next several months. And with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but we'll also have an opportunity to take more questions at the end as well. Thanks, Emery. Uh, and actually, thanks to Ashley and Diane. I think this is going to dovetail nicely into what I have to present today. As mentioned, uh, my name is Sean Barnes. I'm a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist and intensivist at Johns Hopkins. And I'm really excited to continue that talk on uh, about Twitter for education and how we can sort of set up for success and creating a uh, daily um, practice. And so, again, we're, we're focused high on highlighting that benefits of a professional Twitter account and how you can really utilize that, building off of what some of the other speakers have discussed. We'll talk about some real-world examples of how we can use this in our daily medical practice. I know this has been a common reaction uh, when giving talks on social media in the healthcare space. But really, as is the other presenters have said, social media, it's, it's not that complicated. It's honestly a, a really a virtual platform that allows for the exchange of information. And 
what happens is you get these sort of communities and networks that, that sort of build from that. And that's what we're talking about leveraging. I always like to give a shout out to Dr. Ed Mariano. He's an, an anesthesiologist at Stanford. This is a blog post from his um, website back in uh, 2015 on why doctors should be on Twitter. I think there's some excellent content in here and I pull from it anytime I give a talk on social media. I would like to say that I think that it's a bit outdated in that I think all healthcare practitioners should be on Twitter. And I think it's been highlighted by some of the speakers that have already presented here today. And as was mentioned by Ashley, but just again, just to to refresh everybody, the, this is a, was a great piece from Academic Medicine that said your at attending will hashtag tweet you now using Twitter and medical education. Um, for those of you that are newbies, I would recommend this just to get back to the basics. Um, and what, we're see, what we see is that uh, what I'm highlighting here is the, the purple ha hashtag, a phrase used to group tweets by topics. And I know this has been mentioned by our prior speakers, but it really is that important that once again, we're going to sort of talk about that. And um, this search optimization is really unique to Twitter. We don't see this on other platforms. And, and I, I was just last week um, meeting with a senior researcher at Johns Hopkins and about five minutes into talking about how we could better, um, you know, present our, the research that was being done in the uh, Division of Anesthesia, he had to stop me and ask what a hashtag was. And so I recognize that, that it's really can be a foreign topic to some people. But it has been, as uh, once again, we'll say, it's a pound sign in front of a word or abbreviation that keys you in to a specific topic or tweets that are including that hashtag. And it works very similarly to keywords in academia. I'm sure most of the people on this, um, listening to this talk, have gone to PubMed and put in a keyword looking at the latest or most pertinent research. And that's essentially what you're doing. The hashtags can be sub especially specific, which Pete's ICU has been mentioned, and we're actually going to talk about the origin story a little bit. They can be about conferences, uh, which is how most people get introduced into social media. Um, the Critical Care Congress for next year already has their SACM 2023 coined and is using that currently and build up for that. And so that'll have all the conference related hashtag or content will include that hashtag. There can be general hashtags as we mentioned, like so me, um, but they can also be sort of more or, uh, become specific. And so SECM SOMI has done that, which I think is wonderful. And same thing for medical education. So sometimes you only need to search multiple or include multiple in your tweets to make sure you're getting the, the audience, uh, exposure to the audience that you hope would benefit from your tweet. Uh, so PEDS ICU, um, I was uh, great that a few of the other uh, speakers had mentioned this, um, but I was fortunate to be there when we were coming up with these, the, um, the, the hashtag that would be relevant to PEDS for care. So myself, Sapnika Chadkar, my mentor and colleague, and Carly Riley, we're all members of the American Academy of Pediatric Section of Critical Care. And what we wanted to do was build an online community for the Peds Critical Care folks. And so we were inspired by ICU rehab, hashtag ICU rehab, which is Dale Needham and the, and the uh, group at Johns Hopkins. They use this for their ICU rehab conference and they continue using it year round. And they, they noticed that the engagement persisted beyond the conference. And so um, we initially were looking at hashtag pick you, believe it or not, Palm Creek Care Fellows, were, or excuse me, ICUs or were using that. So it was a bit ambiguous. And there was some debate on, you know, pediatrics is spelled a little different depending if what side of the Atlantic you work on. And so, well, but we really wanted to emphasize the pediatric portion of pediatric care. So we did keep it peds and then ICU. And, and what we found with that was that it really, it, it sort of built a, it built a foundation for this developing this community. Um, we've talked about analytics a little bit and simpler signals has a healthcare hashtag project, which has been um, going on for quite some time now. And what this is, is it allows you to register hashtags free um, and that, are meta that are related to healthcare, excuse me. And these can be hashtags that are used every day, such as PEDS ICU or ones that are specific to conferences. And then they have a free analytics platform and then a subscription one. The free one, I've highlighted some screenshots here. You can put in a date range up to 30 days. This is just looking at PEDS ICU usage in the month of June. You can see there was almost 1.5 million um, impressions or sort of the impact factor of that hashtag um, that, use, that, that was included in tweets. Um, in that time frame. you can see there were 364 tweets and 165 individuals. The blue graph shows sort of the ebb and flow of the usage. And then the, the what I've always really appreciated was simpler and enjoyed is that they include sort of a screenshot of the profile pictures of high volume users in that time frame. And so you can see here just sort of the breadth of individuals, organizations, some of the speakers here today highlighted 
that time frame. And it's really great, especially maybe during a conference, when you sort of see all of the people that are jumping in and out and participating on Twitter using these hashtags. And so um, some of the names you've heard today, uh, Sapna and Chris, uh, Carol, my, and myself, we actually just presented this at WIFPIX 2022. And this is looking at four years of Pete's IT data. And uh, you can see it's millions of impressions um, and by month, starting when it was registered in, in uh, 2016 through the fall of 2020. And you can see that the first couple of years, there was very little adoption um, in the sense that we rarely garnered um, uh, a million to over 10 million impressions in any given month. But then it sort of takes off in that last year. As you can see um, in February 2020, there was actually over 51 million impressions. And so it really, I think, it highlights the, the time it takes to build these communities, but also sort of the, the, the size that they can reach and, and how large they can get um, with a little bit of, of, um, of community building. And so in that time frame, we had over 37,000 users, we had over 313,000 tweets and over 640 million impressions. And, and this was actually one of the highlights of the talk that I gave with Pix was this heat map that showed um, how the Pete's ICU um, hashtag began to spread across the globe. So in the upper left-hand corner is the first year uh, after registering, you can see that it's it, there's some fair usage internationally, but it's rather dense in North America. And if you look at the last year analyzed in the bottom right hand corner, you can see how dense the usage is in those countries, both in North and South America, most of Europe, lots of South Asia and Southeast Asia, and then Australia and South America. Again, very, very dense usage of the PEDS ICU hashtag. And I believe um, this a nodal graph was shared earlier, but you can see here again um, in these graphs the you have to have at least an account with 100 or more tweets using this hashtag, and you can see how sparse it was in that first year of usage, and then how dense it becomes by year four, to where you can barely make out any of the uh, Twitter users that are there. And so it's it really again highlights how impactful hashtags can be. And so um, I. I'm myself as a trainee I was studying for my boards and I was tweeting about the Chicago Cubs at that time they were still pretty bad and then um, the um, I was tweeting about sleep and delirium research that I found interesting and I really sort of struck me how I was sort of muddying the the, the efficiency of Twitter and so this uh, newsletter article I wrote for CCAST talks about how I developed my professional Twitter account and the reason that has been stated by others is really to sort of focus your energy and so if you're going to be using social media daily and trying to use it as a tool for education, you're going to want to streamline that process. So as Ashley um, expertly showed how to create an account, right, the first thing you do, and, and this is highlighted both by Diana and Anne-Marie, is, is who you follow, right? But I really want to emphasize this. Curating the, your followers is, is very important because it will filter out the nonsense that can exist on social media because you have complete access and control of your of, your, of those followers. And so I, I recommend first starting with professional societies. So for myself, as someone who's dual trained, um, I actually have to I follow people both in, in critical care as well as anesthesia, but then I, I can't just follow pediatric stuff um, accounts because I'll be missing out on, on the bigger picture of medicine. So it's adult and pediatrics for both of those. And so you can see how big that network becomes. And then you can fill that in with organizations such as research focused organizations and pediatrics. There's policy, educational organizations such as open pediatrics. And then you round it out with medical journals. Medical journals are the leaders, I would say now on social media for dissemination of up-to-date information. Oftentimes now we're finding about, uh, about the latest breaking research on a Twitter account before we're actually going to be reading it on a paper copy in our hands. And I think it, if anyone has submitted any any uh, publications recently, most of the journals, at least the, the larger ones, are asking for you to craft your own tweet and include your Twitter handles because they want to promote your work on their social media platforms. And then the people. Again, you're going to, what happens is once you've built the backbone of professional societies, organizations, and medical journals, right, you round out your Twitter followers with who, excuse me, with who you follow on Twitter with your colleagues and people that are putting out content that contributes to what you're learning. And so you can see here, this is a screenshot. It's a little old at this point, but it included, it includes many, many people that were active in the Pete's IC community. And, and I think it's really important to recognize how large these communities can be. And so with that, right, you also have current events. And this was the article that Anne-Marie was talking about, right? But it, again, it highlights how we're using rapid this this platform for rapid dissemination of information. And so as was alluded to, 
This is a tweet out of the UK about what they were seeing with regards to pediatric infection of COVID-19. And they were highlighting how the PEDS-ICU hashtag and Twitter platform allowed for that information to be shared before we were seeing these cases in the US. It's very powerful stuff. Okay, so now what we've heard about hashtags, we've heard about following people on Twitter. So how do we apply this into our daily practice? Well, we've many of us have found ourselves in a situation where we're all on rounds. This is a picture of us in the PEDS ICU at Hopkins. Um, and you can see here, there are these opportunities for learning that exist. And um, as whether you're the, you know, maybe the, the leader of rounds or you're a presenter or someone in a learning position, they can at times feel a little overwhelming to come up with the content. So say we found ourselves here and we had a troublesome time with a patient with who we were pacing after operating room. And it's been a while since I've given a, a lecture on pacing. So a way I could look up um, some educational content here is I could go to Twitter and I could put in the hashtag, hashtag pacing. And what I might find is this tweet from ICU one pager when the username is one pager ICU. And this is, you can see here, they've included both one pager because this is a very common term for sort of, you know, very distilled information. And then the, the hashtag pacing was what I searched for because I was wondering if anyone had content relevant to that topic that would help me either learn about this topic in, on my own or potentially be a refresher for me to present and or just be something I could then share with trainees after after giving a talk. And you can see this a ton of work's gone into this. There's a very detailed schematic of both of the anatomy as well as the device. Um, it reviews the settings as well as um, the modes and, and when you may or may not use some of these pacing modes. And I think, again, this highlights the power of hashtags and the, the searchability of the platform on Twitter. Now, another way you can find content that would be relevant to your daily education would be by who you follow. And so this tweet here from Critical Cultivation, I wasn't following them at the time, but I was following, I believe it was either Sopna or someone else um, who had retweeted it and they had included the PEDS ICU hashtag. And so it cued me into this, maybe things uh, folks would think more of an adult focus um, information, but actually has high relevance in the pediatric population as well on the RV and ARDS physiology. And you can see here, this is someone has gone through great details with illustrations that really help sort of key home some of the, the takeaway messages as well as some very, very excellent distilled content on both the pathophysiology, diagnosis of the RV dysfunction ARDS, as well as treatment. And then it also is included here is the article, which gives a lot of the data and information so that it's supported, that is supported in this one pager on the RV and ARDS. Again, very two examples of very high yield daily education that is at your fingertips on the social media platform, Twitter. One, we found because of the hashtag pacing, and one we found because of who we followed and our curated uh, list of uh, Twitter followers on our professional Twitter account. This is a paper that I wrote with uh, uh, Bo Sapna um, and Byron Call. Byron is uh, at the time, he was a Palm Creek Care Fellow up in New York. And we really wanted to characterize social media engagement in the critical care community at that time. This was published in 2018. And you can see, again, now four years old and in, on the, in the world of sort of online that's, that must make it outdated, but it, it still keys into some of those high profile Twitter usernames and handles for critical care journals. Again, bringing it back to the, to the research and the science where you're going to be learning the most about uh, late breaking research and education. And then also some of the organizations. And what's really cool about Twitter is, is you can go outside your silo. You can follow the association Association of Critical Care Nurses, right? You don't have to just follow SCCM. You can also follow other ones, although SCCM is one of the best. You're definitely going to follow them, but with PICS and international societies, right? And it's really going to round out your the education you're being, opportunities you're being exposed to. And so, again, to wrap up here, as other speakers and myself have mentioned, Twitter has the best search optimization platform. You really have to leverage your hashtags, right? This can be not only for you promoting yourself and building your network, but also for you tapping into educational opportunities. Curating content is key, whether that's following hashtags, following lists, right, and keeping your followers really focused and dedicated on a professional Twitter account. And then if, as you work both on mastering both of those, it'll easily allow for daily practice of Twitter. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very, very, very much for that.
That was a great overview from all our speakers. We really appreciate everything that you guys have shared with us. Um, at this time, we can definitely take questions. So if the attendees would like to either raise your hand um, or if you'd like to type in your questions, we're happy to take them. Um, I will start with a question that I have. I'm curious, um, as healthcare professionals, you got, everyone is working, how do you um, not, like, how do you stay organized and from a time management perspective, kind of stay on top of how long you spend on Twitter? And I know we talked about the focused approach in terms of following specific organizations, et cetera, but how do you control that? Hi, the question is for, for Shen or for anybody? <laughs> Anyone? Uh, in my case, I try to to follow at least twice a day because I, I work in, with two committees, SCCM and, and NCS and at the journal. But I try to focus on the things that I, I want to. So I don't follow anything else on Twitter. I just follow things related to medicine or to medical information in the areas that I, I, I work with or I study. So this is one of the main things that I do. I, I don't know if Sean has another idea or advice. Yeah, Roberta, it's, I mean, it, it, it's not, there's no magic pill here. Honestly, we all can fall victim to the, you know, never ending, um you know videos and, and so that's one of the things i alluded to when i have you know all of a sudden you're looking at the next marvel movie or a vacation place for your kids like all of a sudden it takes you down rabbit holes so if you can try in addition by you know subtraction and eliminate those from your twitter feed or have two separate ones right maybe one is like you can look at when you want to just relax and chill that's what i do and and, and it helps it helps keep me focused because Maybe you just need a five or ten minute break, and if you're if you're looking at medical related content for five or ten minutes, then it's probably pretty interesting. You're not gonna, it's it's hard to fall into a rabbit hole on those platforms. It still can happen, um, but it's a little easier. It's usually the non healthcare related content that gets us distracted, and so I actually try twice a day, as Roberta mentioned, to just I'll check my notifications. I'll maybe I'll check a list or a hashtag, depending on what's going on. If there's a conference happening that's that's great time to sort of just ch just peek in you can see about you know six hours worth of, worth of conference content shared on twitter in about 20 minutes and get a really good idea of stuff you want to look into yourself or potentially maybe um catch up on with regards to the conference so it really depends on on the sort of setting that you're looking at Yeah, I do agree. <laughs> I don't have a second one, but I <laughs> I think this is a good idea for sure. Thanks all for the advice. Uh, again, for our audience, if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I don't and, see and any. Yep, so we actually yeah. have one more presenter. Um, Roberta is going to present now as well. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. So my name is Roberta. Uh, I'm from Brazil. I'm a critical care doctor in Brazil that recently moved here. So I'm doing my research fellow years at the Department of uh, UCSF at the Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. But I'm also uh, part of the NCS social media as visual editor. And at the SSM, I'm part of the Sony uh, committee too. Uh, this is my Twitter. And these are my main disclosures. Uh, I got on Twitter on March 2020. In November 2020, I started to work at the NCS Journal. Uh, tw Twitter gave me this spot, actually, <laughs> because I, I wouldn't know about it if I, I wasn't there to see the opportunity. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit of what we sh who sh we should follow on Twitter when we think about research, uh, what are infographics and how we can construct an impactful infographic. And uh, what tools do we have to use? There, there are a lot of apps or programs or online tools, but I choose to, to discuss a little bit more. 
So this, I think most of us did that because I think this is a relevant thing, trying to put it in one slide, who you think people should follow. Uh, my, my apologies because this doesn't have anything about pets I see you, just adult. But I think the main journals, uh, they have pediatric sections. So here you have the JAMA, New England Journal, Critical Care, Current Opinion in Critical Care, Critical Care Reviews. And you can take a look, especially the societies that we participate more, you should follow them and follow their journal because you understand how they are using the infographics and the impact that it has. So when you go to the Twitter, the infographics look like this. You are going to have a post with hashtags, as we already talked about, uh, probably uh, enlightening the author of the, the, the paper, if they have it, and trying to put hashtags correlated to the content of the infographics. One of the things that is important is that you are going to have like a link to, to the paper, to the ori original paper, and you can amplify this uh, infographic to have more details. I uh, will show you in the next slides. And here is an example of the Neurocritical Care Journal. As you can see, we, also, we are also trying to publish in another languages. Here I, I Big uh, example of an infographic that was translated into Spanish. Uh, now, at the Neurocritical Care Journal, we have uh, translations into Portuguese, Spanish, and we are starting the Arabic translation because we saw this is in, this makes an impact too. So, when you take a closer look to infographics, what they are going to have? They are going to have uh, the journal informations, the name of the of the paper, and we will try to summarize the important content of that paper in a way that it's really easy for you to take a look and see if you will be interested or not to read the full paper. And that's the main idea. It's like for you to uh, highlight the main points that are important for you or for, the, for the, the author actually, but could be important for other people to read and go back to the paper. The infographic doesn't exclude reading the paper, okay? And I, sometimes I, I, I hear things like this, oh, you made infographics for people not to read the paper. Like, no, we made infographics for people to be curious about it and try to have uh, time to take a look at the paper. And, uh, one of the things that I like the most is, is that every infographic has a conclusion. And we that created the infographics, we need to be really careful because you can't change what is in the paper. We can uh, copy and paste sometimes, that is not a problem, but you can change the content. You can put your main ideas, you can uh, say another thing that the author didn't say. So. This is really important. You have like a commitment to what was published. And here is the other one that we can see that is a, there has a lot of information, but when you amplify the, the infographic, you can read everything. And then you, you know where, the, where the, the paper is, uh, you know the authors, you sometimes we can get some tables or figures from the paper and include because the platforms that we use to create the infographics permit us to do anything. You can download pictures, you can uh, create your own, your own figures, you can do a lot of other things. So how can we make a paper uh, and transform it to one figure? The first thing, that we need to do is to read the paper and be really careful. I always highlight all the important information and I try to decide if there is any graphic or picture from the paper that I should be using the infographic. Uh, I, I can tell you that sometimes I, I don't uh, cut the, 
the pictures and put in the paper, but I, I do something that is similar, especially when you have graphics. You can, uh, ha especially when you are translating to another language, sometimes it's easier for you to take the information and do your own graphic, but you need to be sure that the information is the same. And try to summarize for to an easy way, if you were telling a story to a person that doesn't know anything about the paper, because that's what the infographic is made for. It's made for to be the first impression that from a paper that it's going to be read when you have time. And if you are lucky, you have somebody to review for you, but you should always review when you finish. In my uh, case, I have a support team that is amazing, and Diane is one of the people that helped me with this at the NCS journal. But I really, um, I really say that you you should have at least somebody else to take a look to be sure that you didn't go far away from what was expected from the paper. The main websites that we can use to create infographics are Canva and Pictochart. Um, they all have free uh, space for you to create things. But if you want to use more resources and if you want to download with more quality and everything, you will have to pay. But you can ask for your institution to do it or for your society to do it. But if you want to have your own, you will have to to pay at least, I think, 150 a year or something like that. But if you if you can prove that you are like a PhD or you are studying or you you are a teacher, maybe they will have you. They will give you a discount. But when we start to using this, we realize they are a really great uh, resource. I'm gonna go back here to my picture chart to show you what I do. So this is the picture chart. This is mine. I can do whatever I want. I don't have anybody <laughs> anybody uh, to, to report. And then you have a lot of options. You can do all formats, like you can do an infographic, a presentation, a post, or a report, a flyer, a social media. There is like a, a thousand of options. How do I start? I go to, to the template. I can go to the infographics, for example. And if I hit here in the infographics, they will open another possibility, another window that is all blank. You can put whatever you want here. You can start with figures. You can include texts. And they give you options, especially with colors and you can change absolutely everything. Oh, but this is green. If I click here and I decided that I don't want this to be green, I click in the green and I think I change the color. You can change what is reading, you can change the position, you just click in and you turn, you do whatever you want. So we started to be <laughs> more than doctors now, we, we are learning uh, graphic design and trying to, <laughs> to put things together. But for me, it was really nice because it turned into something that it, I, I really realized that I'm really creative. Um, one example that is not uh, a good one, I was just doing for a presentation for you to view. Just a second that it's opening. Sometimes it takes a while. And uh, you can create absolutely everything. And you will see. In this one, I, I included a Darth Vader that I brought from the website, so from the internet. I downloaded it because you can download anything. Here, this figure is from the picture chart, but I changed the color multiple times. And I included a G for a name, just for you to see. But you can do whatever you want. You can do even more complex uh, infographics as this one. 
that has a lot of information that you can see and you you can be uh, as creative as you want but the most important thing for me is when you try to think about especially uh, in the paper is to be sure that you are giving reliable information so this is what just summarize so at the end what is important it's important that some if somebody has an idea and has a paper uh, and has information results how we are going to deal with these results but try to make this more easy to be visualized and trying to make people to have access to it so that's what twitter is doing it's it's bringing more access to information more access to medical content and in an easy way that you can almost feel that it's more close to you it's it's getting closer to you and i did this last slide using pictochart just to show that we can do everything with pictochart and we don't need to use powerpoint if you want so thank you that was what i had to bring if you want more information about the, the website and how to use or any other questions i'm available to discuss it thank you Thank you very, very much. That was very helpful. I always see these cool infographics and I don't know how to put them together. So that's very helpful. You're welcome. It's I I I didn't know I didn't know anything when I started. I learned in the process. So everybody can learn for sure. Thank you so much. So we'll open up um up questions for the audience again. If anyone has questions, please feel free to either raise your hand in the app or um, type in your question. Um, I do have a question about infographics too. Are they considered like copyrighted once you've made them or are they fair game for anyone? Like if I use someone else's infographic that's posted on Twitter, is that okay? Um, we have all the infographics that are from the NCS and from the critical care. If you, if you pay attention, they have the name of the people that did it. So you can um, you can post because we will have at least our Twitter name on it, and this is easier for you to recognize who did it. But the journals they have the possession of it. In our case, uh, in Neurocritical Care Journal, we have a uh, agreement that everything that we make as a social media uh, committee. Uh, and it's, not, it, it's not ours, it, it's theirs, and we are posting. Everybody can retweet. You don't need to uh, add any other name because in the main document, you have the authors and everything. It would be better for you to retweet the, the main tweet that has the access to the paper because people will have less difficulties to find it if they need to read it. But I think, even if you don't do that, you can put the name of the author, the, the name of the paper, and you will get access to it for sure. That makes sense. Thank you for that tip. You're welcome. All right. We won't see any questions yet. Um, any any additions from any of our speakers? Any final comments? guys have been great this was very very enlightening and we appreciate you taking us from like basics all the way through the data through um tips and tricks um ashley anything you'd like to add no um, well the only thing i was going to say i think it, it was a good point to to mention about who you follow and really curating your followers um like i mentioned i've been on twitter for a really 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 long time and started as a personal account and has evolved into a professional account and so i've had to really kind of um, go through and curate my followings um who i'm following a little bit better and i do think that that um, as we were saying helps you kind of hone in your usage of twitter so you're not just scrolling mindlessly through oh like a cat meme or you know <laughs> not that we don't see cat memes in medical twitter but um 
it, it does help you kind of stay focused when you and, and intentional when you're on the app. Um, so I think that that was a really good. Mm -hmm. All right, we'd like to thank all of y'all again. Uh, and Marie, I'm sorry, were you saying something? I was just gonna say, just get out there and start. Um, yeah. Don't be afraid of it. Um, you can be out there and lurk for a while. You don't have to be posting, you know, infographics, those awesome things that Roberta was talking about on your first tweet to be get out there and be involved and see some of those other tweets and start following people and finding organizations. And if you're willing to be a little bit intentional about it, it can really grow very well organically. Just get out there. Thank you all again. We really appreciate all your expertise and you taking the time to put this together. This was extremely, extremely helpful. And I know once we post it on our YouTube channel, we'll be available to even more audience to learn from it. Thank you all again. Uh, we really appreciate you. And we hope to see all our audience on August 30th for our quarterly um, educational meeting. Again, it will be hosted by our president, the SSCM president, who's going to be speaking about medication and patient safety in the ICU. Till then, everyone take care. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.